עץ חיים היא למחזיקים בה. עץ חיים היא למחזיקים בה. עץ חיים היא לשלום. עץ חיים היא לשלום. So we walked in the front door and, and towards the back on our right was a room with a straw arc and cushions on the floor, no other furniture in that room. People were quietly meditating on the cushions. And then after a while, somebody began a very quiet nigun. And it, I, I was just, it was the most astonishing thing. It was exactly, I was home. I was exactly where God intended me to be. We started Chavorot because synagogues were too big and alienating and lifeless. lifeless. We looked down on American bourgeois values, including the American synagogue, which was this bourgeois place, the ladies with the mink coats and the rich guys who would show up once a year. That was what the American synagogue was. We were creating a new form of Judaism that was in our eyes, better than what we had grown up with. So the idea of shaping it ourselves to our own needs, out of our own encounter with tradition, was profoundly attractive. I know I was seeking to have a place where the, the search for Kedusha and sacred community and my political concerns were shared. I thought that would be, I mean, it does come from that impetus, and I think you're in the 60s, that sort of create the commune, create the small, intensive, intimate community. I like to say that I walked into JTS with, um, in one pocket of my jeans, a copy of Allen Ginsberg's Howell, in the other pocket, a copy of Lev Yitzhak of Bredichev, and both were equally unwelcome at the seminary. I said, I'm going to do something different. I'm going to start a different kind of Jewish community. There has to be a Jewish community for people of our generations that will have different values. There was no longer a draft of ferment for graduate school. In the spring of 68, um, when I knew that I didn't have a deferment, that I needed a deferment, that graduate school was, would not be my deferment, um, or con I think by letter he contacted me telling me about his plans, their plans, to start this alternative um, rabbinical school. Now not everybody joined for a deferment but many people did. For me, this was immediately about Jewish learning. It wasn't, the draft deferment was an excuse, a way to get people to do this. Why would people take a year or take a couple of years to do this? Well, it was getting them out of the draft, but I was interested in getting people to create some kind of alternative Jewish community. I didn't know exactly what. It was called Chavurat Shalom Community Seminary. I remember my mother saying, she didn't like that name because it sounded like I was going to a community college. We thought of ourselves as an intentional community. And again, there, there would be a lot of discussion and debate about what intentional community meant. But at the very least, it meant that we all lived in proximity to each other. There were communal meals once a week. There was meeting once a week. There were retreats uh, at least four times a year. Um, Shabbat services, Friday night, and, and there was an exhortation that you would volunteer to do stuff. Um, cleanups and, and planning stuff. And so it was, it was, it was very clear this was going to be the center of your lives. This community was going to occupy the center in the middle of your life. But I don't think they were so interested in Israel at the time. I, I just don't think it was... So. It wasn't so important to them. They, I, I, it's what George said in the beginning of the interview. You know, it was more what they were going through at the time uh, that was important. It was more about religion and spirituality and learning, and not about Jewish peoplehood. To be a member of the Chabura means when you land at Logan Airport, you can call anyone on the Chabura list without embarrassment, and ask them to come pick you up. That was the 
position paper. And then I remember once getting a call from Joel Rosenberg, who was at Logan, said, could you come pick me up? I was so happy that he called because I could fulfill my duty, it's kind of my mitzvah, of picking him up at the airport. And I didn't want to say no, even though I knew I was allowed to say no, because he had, you know, sort of checked off the box there of what you're allowed to do. What had happened was a kind of rebellion inside Jews for Urban Justice uh, from people who were more interested in religious expression and less interested in political expression. So Rob Agus, who was the son of a rabbi, knowledgeable, and so thought of himself as a conservative Jew in a new, in a new framework. Went to the local UJA and said, we need some money to do this. And no question because of, largely because of my father's reality, the presence, they took it seriously and they gave us $15,000 for the first six months. His vision was to create a Jewish uh, counterculture center. I think that was the terminology he was using at the time, um, uh, uh, in, in Washington, D.C. We attracted uh, a very wide group of people, some of whom knew stuff about Judaism and some of whom knew almost nothing. And that was fine with us. And then we needed a building. <clears throat> so it's on Florida Avenue, 2158 Florida. And that building was uh, used by Roman Catholic sisters. They were so happy to be doing this. You know, they thought it was thrilling that we were making use of this facility. Rob Agus picked for Brengen. And he didn't know any Yiddish, so he didn't know it was Far Brengen. And uh, he named it after the meeting of Hasidim with the Rebbe. That's what a Fabrengen is in Hasidism. In fact, there was a joke, how come we misspelled, it's supposed to be Farbrengen. And Rob said, well, there are two reasons. The earthly reason is I called my mother and asked her how to spell it, and I misheard her over the phone. But the heavenly reason is that that R is for Rebbe, and we don't have a Rebbe. Cover at Shalom had been created in the fall of 68. So word of it was all over. And what was, that was about smaller community and studying in different kinds of ways. What I remember as the <coughs> kind of self-identity, at least of the New York Havara, was that it was going to be a place where the people that you prayed with would be the people that you studied with, would be the people that you did politics with. That's the way we always defined ourselves. Havara Shalom was heavily associated with, um, with art, and I think Fabrengen was heavily associated with author. Waskow. Waskow. And um, I don't think, I think New York Havra was, didn't have someone like that for good or for bad. Um, I think we thought it was for good, but uh, there's nothing about, it was just a different, different model. What characterized New York Havra, uh, especially was our monthly retreats. And that was really different. Every single month, we went away on a retreat for Shabbat. We would leave Friday afternoon, come back Saturday night. That's very intense. I mean, just the organization at each retreat, there would need to be a coordinator. That requires location, transportation, food, tefillah, discussion. We did Kabbalah Shabbat Friday night. That, that's when we davened. If we davened, we Kabbalah Shabbat Friday night, Shabbat. Uh, morning, we would daven together. We would have conversations late into the night. We would have study sessions. We would walk. We would play, whatever. But sort of being part of that and building community was uh, a really big piece of it. A very uh, distinct memory I have from the first retreat we had was, I think it was lunch on Shabbat. And we were finished eating. And I said, I kind of like banged on the table and said, let's bench. And all of a sudden, everyone looking at me as if I had presumed to carry over a tradition that I took for granted rather than opening up for questioning about whether we should.
to be a full-time member of the Chavura, you had to be taking, if I remember rightly, three courses. And those three courses would meet for three hour, hour and a half sessions during the week. I, of course, was very seduced by the uh, prospectus for the Chavura, which in, uh, had a whole list of courses that I was very interested in. There were courses in Jewish mysticism, courses in Hasidism, uh, in uh, the Song of Songs, in Kabbalah. The emphasis in the Chavura cur curriculum was on the mystical slash agadic side of the Jewish tradition. Intense study, but more personal, spiritual seeking, theologically open kind of study. The kinds of questions you didn't ask in university classroom, and you didn't even ask in the JTS classroom. When Everett Gendler came the second year, he uh, taught a course on Jesus and the Gospels, which I took. And again, this was like, what? We are studying Jesus and the Gospels at a Jewish seminary. This is fascinating. People who were teaching classes would be sitting next to you in a class, themselves taking a class the next day. And that's a very powerful message. It's, the message is that we are a community of learners. You can have something to teach the group, but you're also going to be, in a, you know, another time you're going to be a learner in the group. I had some knowledge of stuff from reading Gershom Scholl and reading some other things, but um, I didn't have knowledge of texts, you know? And here we were sitting around discussing a text. I say, oh, this is something. This is a new kind of experience. It was the best use of traditional text that I have ever experienced. It wasn't to learn and know more. It was to know each other. We had classes there. I taught. Uh, I taught Hebrew, I think. Can't remember exactly what else. We had classes in Hebrew, in Sidur, in uh, Talmud, um, Yiddish when Max came. And there was a sculpture, sculpture class at night, and there were workshops uh, on all sorts of ideas. I taught one on um, Judaism, socialism, and anarchism. Trying to live in relationship to the tradition, not just halachically, but spiritually. What did it mean? What did, what did the Torah have to say to us? What did later writings have to say to us about you know, how we should live our lives, about what the life meant, about how to structure our lives. Right. You know, and of course, and we had to invent our tefillah, what was it going to be? Um, it was not at first egalitarian, it would slowly become egalitarian, but again, the natural move was men would lead. But, you know, how we would pray, um, which siddur we would use, what we would include and not include, how much English, how much Hebrew, because the group was, you know, was quite varied in terms of their backgrounds. We experimented a lot with what we call creative liturgy, and that meant playing Stravinsky in the background, and it meant, it meant reading poetry. Oh, uh, I thank you, God, for this most amazing day by E. e. Cummings. Must have been read a hundred times until we got sick of it, because uh, that was went with Yotzer Or went with the miracle of the day. If somebody wanted to try something, they were given the opportunity to try something. I mean, the fact that we were, you know, that David and I could imagine bringing, you know, uh, <laughs> bringing Bach to, to Shabbos morning was like, oh, you know, there, there are things here that could be meaningful to us if we figured out how to engage with them. Somebody would say, you stop the service and say, you know, today I thought that we would sing this prayer because it's uh, the 4th of July and we want to think about what does it mean to be an American in our times with the war and all this stuff. And we would sing to <clears throat> this tune. We're going to introduce this tune. Or we're going to say, add a special reading on. No, I, I actually remember one... Shabbat service that was all silent. Um, I don't know what we did, but I think it was all silent. What was going on was David Schneer leading Friday night um, psalms, I mean, leading Kabbalah Shabbat. And, and we're doing Hasidic Nuganim interspersed with, um, with readings. You know, sometimes I would hand, uh, I would pass around the Martin Buber's 10 Hasidic rungs and pick out a teaching from Martin Buber. The, I like the dancing, I like the, eff, the, you know, as Durkheim would say, the effervescence. And it was kind of, you know, kind of the right balance of, of music, okay, 
the emotive, you know, and also the the intellectual, the thought we're trying to be careful not to. It was very little talking, you know. It was mostly you know listening, and singing, chanting. And the thing that was amazing about Chavrat Shalom that I've never seen anywhere else is when we began a, a nigan, we didn't end it after two, 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 you know, singing it twice through and then you stopped. We continued the nigan until the nigan came to its natural close when it was the time for it to end and the group subsided from the nigun, that's when the nigun ended. Kakohotz gefällt mir nicht, Kakohotz geht mir, weil Kotz ist doch beim Koima Mikdesh, Kotz ist doch beim Koima Mikdesh, Kakohotz darf man Eule Regel sein, Eule Regel sein. Neo Chassidic. It was like it. It took elements from Hasidic prayer, but it it had a kind of modern Americanized spin to it. It was Hasidism combined with Heschel, combined with Buber, combined with just the sort of cultural quest for intensity in our in our age, in our generation. There was an intentional appropriation of what wasn't ours, Eastern Europe wasn't ours. The melodies were, was, we, there was an intentional appropriation and then it became ours through the Chavura. In other words, it became, this, what was characteristic, it was one of the first forms of true American Judaism. We were creating an, a, an authentic form of American spirituality, in some ways on the fly, but in relationship with the traditional source. Shabbos morning, we used to say, that's our service to the Jewish community and literally the service to the Jewish community. And there we had a lot of people would come. And anybody could come. And, and as we became famous, we kind of got, you know, sort of uh, tourists, you might say, Jewish tourists, would come to Chavurat Shalom. What our Shabbos morning was mainly about for a long time was simply, as you've probably already heard, reading the Parsha aloud in English and stopping to discuss it. And whenever anybody has somebody they want to, something they want to talk to, they stop and say, it's not just the person who's reading, anyone could say, and this is the, the classical Chavara locutions, I have problems with this. I have problems with the fact that you have legal slavery. I have problems with the sexism in this story. I have problems with the ethical implications of being charged to murder the Canaanites. We tried to understand the difficult parts by coming up with interpretations. Yeah, there was a feeling that we should be meeting across um, our, our local lines because we had a larger, larger um, platform to look at, larger sense of uh, what our agendas should be and what we might be exploring with one another to look at. So that's where Weiss's Farm began. And the conversations were just amazing. The first Weiss's Farm was Sukkot of 73. Um, so it was amazing. I mean, it sort of made clear that this was not just an idiosyncratic thing that we were doing in Washington. Camp people are camp people forever. So the extent to which many people in the Chavara had shared Jewish summer camp, much of it Ramah, not entirely, the retreat approximated that. I had a sense of um, the Chavara as a movement, not as just my personal journey. I had a Even sense of Chavara. Early on, absolutely. Because it seemed to me such an amazing model for the Jewish community. How could we not have seen ourselves as pioneering an entirely new Judaism? You know, one that was going to not be the failed Judaism we knew, but a successful Judaism of engagement. Liz Colton, one of the New York people, told me, oh, it's clear, the Boston people are the mystical Chavara, the New York people are the academic Chavara, and you and Fabrengen are the political Chavara, which fit who we were and where we were and like that. The Chavara Summer Institute, which exists to this day, came out of Weiss's farm. You know, it was a bigger venue for Weiss's farm.
we had a, the Furbring and Fiddlers that David put together were played at these events. The Furbring and Fiddlers, I guess, might be probably the first, if you want to give us a, a place in the, in the archives, probably the first Jewish counterculture, you know, band. This record has grown out of the coming together, that's what Verbringen uh, means, of creative talents in an atmosphere of new Jewish discovery and rediscovery, of a tradition once thought lost and of a future once thought abandoned. Shiru Ladonai Shir Chadash, it is a new song we are singing. Those words are all, was also, all, I also set to music and became like the, the theme song, I guess, of the early Verbringen. Shiru Adonai, Shiru Adonai, Shiru Adonai, Shiru Adonai. The Jewish catalog, of course, is uh, you know a very important uh, evolution of of Chavara culture. A lot of the definition of Chavara, I think, comes from the Jewish catalog, and it's its major expression. There were, uh, you know, 20 of us out in the backyard trying to figure out how to put up a sukkah. And, you know, as I say, a bunch of, of Jewish guys who, who didn't know which end of the hammer to use, you know. And, and I, I said at the time, I said, uh, you know, there should be a Jewish whole earth catalog that you look into and you get instructions on how to build a sukkah. Richie's decided to try and do it. George didn't want to do it. Uh, Sharon s said, oh, she'd help out, and I joined, so it was the three of us. You know, as, as the whole Earth catalog demonstrated, there were lots of people who were interested in this kind of reappropriation of the tools and resources of life to, to empower and, and revivify their, their, their experience. You know, as I like, part of the charm of the catalog is like the picture of the younger people, they look like every other American kid that age. Like you, you couldn't, you wouldn't know that they're Jewish, right? And that was part of the charm and the importance, as I said earlier, of you could be completely contemporary. It wasn't like you had to give up living in America in 1970 to be part of the Jewish thing. When my son he went to a magnet high school and we were trying to figure out what he could do Jewishly before he could start prose door in eighth grade. And I thought, no big deal. We'll get a bunch of kids who stop day school, you know, in eighth grade and we'll have a study group. And, um, you know, I started calling around parents of Sheck to school, kids who were out and saying, you know, we have a group. And they, they were responding to me like I was some kind of lunatic who had called them up on the phone, you know, create your own class for a kid? You know, what are you talking about? <laughs> and I realized that I was totally a Havra Jew, that to me it was obvious that if you had a Jewish need, you created what you needed to fulfill it. And, and in a sense, that's what Jewish feminism has been, is taking the power to define and redefine Judaism. So uh, I see them as completely feeding into each other. The New York Havara, much earlier than the Boston people, accepted women as independent members. Near, uh, the Boston Havara, I think, Havara Shalom initially, the only way a woman could be a member was if she was married to a man. But there were a couple of single women in the New York Havara. Um, and women's membership was officially taken seriously and equally. Earl, pretty f quickly there was a women's group formed which had a lot of the, um, probably in 72 or 73, there's a women's group formed that had a lot of the energy of the community in it and then there was another women's group formed afterwards. The, the Havara. It was. Yeah. It was already egalitarian space and in that sense, it was a base from which we could go out. But I don't think we were yet imagining, demanding more substantive changes that we would bring to the Havra. Right. And know. I don't think 
the men saw that as in any way threatening. I mean, we were just doing our thing, right. and they were already egalitarian, so, you know, what was the big deal? It was, uh, from the get-go, egalitarian for women and men. It was a basic principle. In fact, when we met the Chavarat Shalom people, we were shocked at how male it was. I think, we again, I think we were a little blind to the fact that it was basically a men's group and there were a few women sprinkled in. We also wanted to be fully equal members. Um, and uh, it didn't, it didn't work, and it didn't work in part because um, I don't think most of the men cared about that very much. When we started, there was no seminary ordaining women. So it, the idea that women would be members, first thing, they weren't going to be drafted. Second thing, whoever heard of a woman rabbi. So both of those things were off the table. My experience um, in the Chavra was that women's voices were not suppressed, but they were not heard as as powerfully as men's voices were. Um, I don't think I'm looking back and coloring it. I think that was accurate. I didn't feel unfree to say whatever I wanted. So we generally had this feeling that we were at the crest of, of openness and egalitarian sharing, and it never crossed our minds until questions came up about how we would handle halachic questions. We considered ourselves really at the forefront of that kind of openness. And I think a lot of people would have shared that at that time. It's just somehow we just, Mona said we were clueless. It's a, it was a weird balance. If I had something to say, I felt like people listened to it. Um, if I spoke in a class, I felt like people heard what I had to say. But I don't feel like I was ever a decisor and, I'm, and a, a deciding voice in the group. We didn't need to advocate for changes in Fabrengen. We had what we needed, um, but we wanted to know more. Um, and uh, we were very, you know, I can't remember what year Ezrat Nashim was, but we... 71 or 2. Yeah, I think we were very proud to hear about that. Uh, we cheered our sisters on. It started as a class within the New York Chavara, mm -hmm. and then Ezrat Nashim... I think as Ratnashim always saw itself as part of yeah. the New York Chavara, mm -hmm. even though it, in a sense, grew beyond it. When I, by the time I came back to New York in 74, um, as Ratnashim was kind of CR group, women's talk group, we, and we, we did the um, baby naming ceremonies booklet at that point, but it did really stop being an activist group, but we definitely thought of ourselves as part of the New York Havara. We never wanted to create a package. This is how you create a Havara in your community. We never wanted to be what we call the Holy Mother Church of the Havara movement. That sounded repulsive to us. We believe that each Havara has to arise spontaneously out of its own situation and the needs of its own people. And I think that was a mistake. We might have spread the ideal of Chavura uh, more widely had we been less, adver less averse to public relations and organ organization of effort and things like that. Utopia means that, you know, it's, so it's a flash in the pan, but it creates a model of what's possible. The Chavura movement is a, is a blip on the screen of Jewish continuity and Jewish community, and yet um, it is also something that's had profound impact in very um, significant ways that are actually unidentifiable throughout the, throughout the Jewish world. The American synagogue has become a much less formal and pretentious place. It's a place where the values of community are taken much more seriously in a good synagogue and where the rabbi is much more a facilitator of community than he, she was ever trained to be in those days. In other words, all these independent minyanim that sprang up, sprang up as a, you know, you can trace it back to Chavrat Shalom. You absolutely can. The understanding about why Jews study, not in the Orthodox community, but in the non-Orthodox community, um, that came from, from Chavra. That's where that came from. And, you know, it's interesting to see, if you look at the people that came out of New York Chavra and 
Fabrengen and Chavrat Shalom that ended up running stuff it, in various ways. Um, the way that their Chavura experience either influenced it or either influenced those institutions or at any rate influenced the people and the way they thought about those institutions. You know, I think the the model of participatory kind of do-it-yourself Judaism, which was so critical to us and which we found so fulfilling and uh, enlivening, is still alive and well. I mean, in New York, you've got Mahon Hadar, you've got Altschul, you've got all these different, you know, kind of like Chavurot who think they've created it, who think they came up with the idea of it. So in many ways, my whole life has been shaped by, by the Chavura years, my whole project. I sometimes define my project as what I call creating a seeker-friendly Judaism. Um, creating a Judaism that welcomes seekers and has room for seekers and people with more questions than answers and, and so on and saying, yes, you too belong in this tradition and, and have a place in it and can be leaders of it. Um, leaders of it because you're one step ahead of your people around you in seeking, not because you have all the answers. And all of that really is language I would have used already in the Chavara. All those people who said to us back in the 70s, you know, you're going to destroy the Jewish community, you're taking all the, you know, the future out of it. No, in fact, they saw that we had something <laughs> that worked and they started imitating it. So synagogues all over the country have created what they call Chavarot, which are smaller groups that of some sort or another, they do different things in different synagogues, but they're, they enable people to form communities and feel connected. The Chavarot Shalom and then the subsequent Chavarot tapped into something very profound in American Judaism that was missing. Number one, it, we needed more intimacy, like a shtibel. Number two, we needed to rescue or come back to a more experiential, emotional, and nigun-based um, kind of exploratory approach as opposed to the sort of basically for many people it was a dead experience going to synagogue um, and I think in many different ways and most people have no con no awareness at all that this is connected to Chavara Shalom um, the whole Chavara movement is an attempt to create more intimacy more relevance more depth and some of them are study sessions some of them are davening some of them are eating some of them are socializing raising the kids together to me that's all good right in other words the whole notion that the Chavara movement and other independent minyanim have tapped into the need for intimacy and, and spiritual exploration that was really missing at, the t at that particular historical period. It legitimated a way of being Jewish in our culture um, that other people then adapted to their own needs. And, and the adaptations are considerable, but I still see them, um, you know, let me just again, just give the Temple Israel example, you know, the fact that at Temple Israel before they have their large service on Shabbat morning. Every week they get together in small groups to study Torah is important. It is an important manifestation of uh, this sort of trend. I take great pleasure in that actually. I think it's not only enriched our lives, but I think it has made a real difference in the larger American Jewish community without people necessarily saying, oh yeah, that goes back to Chavarat Shalom, and I don't really care about the attribution piece, but I do think that it made a difference yeah. and has made a difference. And I think from an ongoing perspective, the Chavara idea um, is very important that people feel sustained and nourished Jewishly with, at all these different levels. Shiru Adonai, Shiru Adonai, Shiru Adonai, Shir Chadash. Shiru Adonai, Shiru Adonai, Shiru Adonai, Shir Chadash. Shiru 